Okay, so, uh, oh, that's a bit, okay, that's a bit loud. Um, so, uh, have you all got the, the handout for this lecture, not the one that was kind of lying around before I came in? Um, so it should have some pictures of seaweed on the front of it, and uh, not this slide, which I've uh, found more recently, and uh, I think it's kind of better. Anyway, um, just to point out, so I tried to, um, well, I did try and uh, print them out uh, all colour for you, but I did them last, the end of last week, and each week I get a thousand pounds of printer credit, which sounds super awesome, but every time I print out your lecture thingies, it costs about 350 pounds if I do it in colour. So at the end of last week, I didn't have enough printer credits to print the stuff out in colour, um, so I did it in black and white. Uh, it shouldn't matter too much for this lecture. Um, there were a few uh, colour maps and stuff which, um, which might need a bit of annotation and, and explaining, but uh, the, um, this, this, the colour version is available um, online now, so uh, um, on the learn thing, so you can... Um, Look at that. Um, okay, so today's lecture is uh, all going to be about marine pollution uh, and basically how we've made the oceans a very bad place for other organisms to live um, and how that's, that's bad. Um, but it's not just going to be, well, there's going to be quite a lot of, oh, look at this, it's very bad. But there's going to be a little bit about how the pollution is linked in with some of the, the processes that we've been talking about in the rest of the oceanography course and how those either mitigate or, or make the, uh, the whole kind of fiasco a little bit worse. Um, okay, so briefly, you know, what is a pollutant? So pollutants can be almost anything, any kind of chemical species or thing that's in the ocean uh, where there's too much of it. So quite a lot of things are pollutants are there naturally anyway, but it's just that there's too much of them. So for instance, nutrients, Okay, it's perfectly natural that there are lots of nutrients in the ocean, but if you get too much of them in one place, that can be thought of as a pollutant. Okay? So there are some things, some kind of man-made synthetic chemicals, which there shouldn't be any of in the ocean, so any concentration of those in the ocean can be considered a pollutant. Um, but but yeah, just to point out that you know, some things can be kind of like considered pollutants. Things like oxygen. Right? So you could have, if there's 50% oxygen in the atmosphere, that's really bad, okay? Everything would suddenly combust and catch on fire. So you know, things that are essential for life, um, okay, too much of them, too much of a good thing is bad. Much like ice cream. Um, okay, so um, this, is, this is not a, I guess this is a bit of a bullshit map really, but um, just to say that kind of where pollution is, is usually where it's released into the ocean. So uh, sources of pollution, so these are kind of what, where people live, tend to have high levels of pollution. We'll see later on that this map is not entirely accurate for different kinds of pollution, but kind of the further you go away from human activity, so Southern Ocean, Antarctica, Patagonia, places like that, places around there um, relatively more pristine than places around kind of Western Europe, US and kind of um, Eastern Asia. Okay, so our first kind of case example of, of, of bad stuff we put in the ocean uh, are these marine plastics. So this is quite a, a topical uh, um, kind of subject at the moment. But these are basically little bits of plastic. Um, some of them can be quite big, but I say that we've put in the ocean because we're really lazy, okay? Because we just haven't been bothered to separate out our rubbish, or we've just thrown our rubbish into the sea, or put it in a place near the sea that's then eroded into the sea. Um, so this is a model of where that plastic is, and you'll notice that it's very different from that first map that I showed you of where the pollution is. So in this case, this is just floating marine plastic, so there is a concentration of plastic kind of debris and pollution around the coastal zones, but this is stuff that's floating, and you'll perhaps hopefully remember from uh, some of Simon's lectures that we have these ocean gyres, which basically water circulates around them, in a cyclonic manner, so cyclonic being the same way that the Earth rotates, different ways in different hemispheres, but these basically trap floating kind of debris. Okay? Um, so the scale on here, I think it's kind of like a little bit bullshit because it's a model, but I mean, you can see that large parts of the ocean have got relatively high concentrations of just floating plastic that we've, we've put into the ocean. Um, and it's not just kind of plastic that you can kind of lumps of it you can see. So this is something that's uh, also quite topical at the moment. I think it was on the Wong show last week for those of you that 
watch the one show. Um, uh, so these are like little tiny little beads of plastic that get put into cosmetics and face scrubs and toothpaste and kind of stuff that you have if you want to make yourself kind of clean and nice looking. Um, and these things uh, basically just get flushed down uh, the drain. Uh, they're too small to be picked out by most um, uh, waste treatment plants and they, they make their way into the, the ocean. So this was a study that was done I think last year or the year before. Um, so what these, uh, what these scientists did was they, they got some of these cosmetics, they basically filtered out uh, of those cosmetics the uh, little microbeads and they dumped them in some fish tanks that had zooplankton in. And you've done zooplankton with Merriweather, kind of like the second rung on the food web in the, in the, in the ocean. So these are things that eat plankton. And before they dumped them in, they dyed the um, they dyed them at little plastic beads with fluorescent dye so they could see where they went. And you can see that the, uh, the zooplankton are eating these little plastic beads. Uh, you can see this is a fecal pellet of a um, zooplankton. So they are passing them through. Okay, so they're not totally clogging up the, uh, the zooplankton. So the zooplankton do survive. Okay, and this is kind of like a, another example of these kind of like macroplastics. This is a bird that's died and they've cut it open and it's kind of full of plastic. Okay, so the plastic's probably not that damaging to the bird because it's managed to survive long enough to ingest all of the, the other plastics. So, but the thing that this kind of stuff does is, and, the, and this study showed, was that these. Uh, zooplankton that have got lots of these tiny little plastic beads inside them are much less productive. So they're able to gain biomass much slowly, much more slowly. Uh, so they're less able to transfer energy up through the different trophic levels in the, in the food web. And it's kind of analogous to kind of like gastric band surgery here. So this is a, uh, a nice uh, American lady who uh, has had gastric band surgery and now she looks like this. So she's basically less capable now of putting on biomass, which is very similar to what's happening here in the, um, in the zooplankton. Okay? You're stuffing their stomachs full of stuff that they can't eat, and that's causing them to be less effective at, um, at producing kind of themselves, and therefore less food available to larger organisms that eat them. In addition to this kind of like physical effect of blocking kind of like the stomachs of these kind of organisms, there's also the possibility that these plastics do either leach out toxic materials and also they act as a surface for other toxins to kind of be transported around the marine environment. But that's, that's a kind of a subject that's a lot less known about, a lot less quantified at the moment. I mean, it could be that you know, they scavenge all the nasty chemicals, stick onto the surfaces and those chemicals become inert. And we don't. But there's, that's, a, that's a, basically a hot area of research. At the moment, um, I, kind of, I put this in because this is uh, it's kind of another example of where I've actually probably contributed to the problem, and uh, oh, I've seen it kind of in action. So this is um, this is a place called Captain Cook on the Big Island of Hawaii, a uh, place I visited because uh, you know, as part of being uh, kind of an oceanographer slash geochemist slash geologist, I kind of, this kind of place that I go on conferences for fun, sorry for science. Um, mm. Uh, and we had a, a kind of an expedition to this place here. So this is actually where Captain Cook was killed uh, by the local Hawaiians, uh, who he kind of offended. Uh, they're having a big religious war at the moment at the time, and uh, he kind of got involved. So this is where he was killed and cooked. Uh, it's not entirely sure whether he was eaten. Probably not. Uh, but this is this 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 roped off area here is uh, actually technically part of the United Kingdom. So it's been ceded from the U.S. The United Kingdom as a kind of Morning. But anyway, so you can you see all these people here, they're visiting this area because it's really fantastic for snorkeling. There's lots of corals, lots of fish and all that kind of stuff. And what these people do, what I did, is I canoed across this place over here. And they see they dragged all their canoes out onto the coral, onto the rocks, uh, and that scraped off bits of the plastic of their canoes as they do that. So when you snorkel in this area, you can see little bits of plastic floating around in the water column that fish are eating. Okay, you think that's not very really good, I've just done that. So that's, you know, one of these places where, I mean, this, this is probably not a large flux of plastic to the global ocean, kind of snorkelers dropping bits of stuff. But, you know, this kind of activity, which is basically, you know, thoughtless pollution that I've done, which was bad for me, bad, okay, um, adds plastic to the ocean. The reason I have that is because I found this paper, uh, which is, 
This is a, an example also from Hawaii, where there's now so much plastic in the environment. Um, that's not the handout for today. There should, are there any spare handouts? Go and sit with the guys up there, they'll, they'll hook you up. Um, um, there's now so much plastic in the ocean that it's actually now forming large parts of rocks. Okay, so these are called plastiglomerates, because they're conglomerates, which is basically, uh, for those that are not doing geology, which is a word for a, a conglomerate, is a rock made out of bits, big bits. Okay, so you can see here that this is a kind of rock that's almost like an igneous plastiglomerate. So when, this is a bit of rope here, some more possibly netting or something like that. These are rocks from Hawaii that are, were hot, either through hydrothermal activity or just being recently erupted, and they've actually melted the plastic onto the rock. Whereas this is an example where uh, on the beach, okay, the beach, all the particles on the beach are starting to get cemented together by calcium carbonate, and they're incorporating little, little bit of bits of plastic into their rock. Okay, so I think I've put the, uh, the paper about that on Learn. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's just a, it's just basically, it's uh, just a marker of how much we've we've basically altered the planet. We're now actually making rocks out of plastic. Okay, so we're going to move on now to hydrocarbons, oil. Okay, so this, uh, this is, I guess, uh, important for Scotland. So this is uh, the Ineos plant at Grangemouth. This is basically, this is our manufacturing economy. Without that, we can't make anything. Okay, this is basically turns oil into all kinds of oil derivatives, uh, which get made into plastics, chemicals, that kind of thing. So without that, we're pretty screwed. Okay, this is it. It's a pretty horrible place. Okay, have you visited Grangemouth? Yeah, have a good time. Yeah, so it smells, I mean, it's got, and it basically drains off into the fourth, the fifth, the fifth, the fourth, of here, it's very polluted uh, stretch of water. Um, and the reason for that is all of this lovely oil that Scotland has at this. This is Scotland's territorial waters, not territorial. It's, it's like, it's, this is Scotland's water over here. You can see Scotland's got some oil, England, lots of gas. Um, uh, so in, uh, this is from the Scottish government's website, and uh, they have a map for 2008 for some reason, presumably because that was the year where there were the least oil spills, I don't know why they put that one up there. But you can see here that these are the recorded, okay, these are the recorded, not the actual, these are the ones that the oil companies fessed up to, spills of oil in 2008 in Scottish waters. Um, so the ones in grey are obviously not in Scottish waters. Um, so you can see that these are being added to the environment and, and um, that's bad. But I mean, you can see the kind of, that you probably can't make out the numbers up here, but the, the largest circles of oil uh, go up to almost 60,000 kilograms of oil, uh, which is quite a lot, okay? But the ocean is really big, okay? And that is, so these are actually very, very small spills compared to some of the large ones that we've, uh, we've seen uh, in the, the I mean, these don't, these don't even make it into the local news. Um, so it's not just where the oil is spilled that's a problem. So it's where it's transported around. So these are kind of like just uh, cartoony, you know, oil comes from the Middle East and is used in the Western world, okay? And China, and so it has to be transported to those places. There are very few pipelines. Pipelines also leak. Um, so it's transported in big ships, which have this annoying habit of hitting things, each other, uh, bits of land, and leaking all that oil into the ocean. Okay, so this is kind of an example of that, but you can kind of think of any of the Sea Empress in Pembrokeshire, the Exxon Valdez in Alaska, these, I mean, these huge, I mean, these are really big ships, okay? It makes no economic sense to use small ships, so when they run aground, they do dump an enormous quantity of oil into the environment. Okay, so we're going to learn a little bit about, you know, just, I mean, dumping that oil into the environment, that's bad, but what actually happens to it? So uh, the oil itself is toxic, kind of large, kind of macroorganisms like seabirds, they, they eat the oil or they get covered in it, so they kind of, they die, okay? Um, but there are other things that happen to that oil that determine kind of how long it hangs around in the environment, how toxic it is, how bioavailable it is, and what, it, what happens to other, what is the effect of that oil on other kind of essential parts of the biogeochemical cycle system, nutrients and um, oxygen, okay? So there are a whole bunch of processes that happen to oil. So we, we dump oil into the ocean, 
either normally, accidentally, but um, sometimes deliberately. Uh, and a whole bunch of things happen to it. So some of the, the heavier constituents sink down and hit the seafloor, where it's mostly out of the kind of the, the environment. But you know, things live on the seafloor, uh, and they um, and they don't like oil. Uh, uh, some of that oil gets sprayed at the atmosphere, so it's very, very stormy. That breaks up the oil, which is kind of good because that makes it into easily digestible bits of oil, which other organisms can process and, and get rid of. But by, by you do spray it up onto the land, okay, so which creates other hazards both to human health and to agriculture and all that kind of thing. Uh, but it's this kind of stuff that we're going to talk about for a bit. So what happens to that oil as it starts to break up into smaller and smaller droplets? Okay, and how that impacts the carbon cycle. So, I mean, this is uh, just just to point out that these, these things don't last forever. So, usually, the effects of a large oil spill, okay, are usually over by a kind of a year. So, uh, when the Sea Empress ran aground in uh, Pembrokeshire in the early two thousands, I think it was, um, when you went back. A year later, it was almost completely kind of cleaned up. And most of that cleanup process was kind of done by the environment, not by people. But there were still long term effects on the ecosystem. So when you basically wipe out an entire kind of ecosystem by putting loads of oil on, it takes a while for that to recover back to kind of a natural population state. So basically, the first thing that comes back is you get loads and loads of algae that grows, and that's not, I mean, the oil's gone, but it's not a a healthy ecosystem and then that algae leads to an explosion and you just get loads of limpets everywhere or whatever eats algae right so you have a very unbalanced ecosystem immediately after the oil spill but the oil itself on the scale of a few years is mostly out of the, uh, the environment so this map at the top is is now um this is now the big guys really big oil spills so uh so you see the, the colored circles there are the um Deepwater Horizon, uh, which uh, BP and Halliburton decided that would be a good idea to, to put into the ocean. The enormous one over the Middle East uh, is actually a deliberate one. So that was when uh, the uh, Republican National Guard of Iraq um, uh, decided to set all of the oil fields on fire in, um, in Kuwait uh, when the, at the end of the, depending on where you're from, either the first or the second Gulf War uh, happened, and they were retreating uh, from the, um, the Allies. They just set everything on fire, and loads of oil went into the environment. Okay, so what I mean, what do we do about that? Okay, so this is the kind of thing that happens. A large macrofauna get, get covered in, in oil. Okay, that's that's a big PR disaster, and also a disaster for the environment. So we try to start break up that oil by spraying dispersants onto it. So, so basically, it's washing up liquid. Okay, it's fancy washing up liquid that basically starts to break up the oil into smaller and smaller droplets. Okay, so these smaller and smaller droplets, okay, once you, you, you basically start to massively increase the surface area of that oil, so it can be attacked mostly by bacteria. So all oil is, is organic carbon. Okay, and that's basically a food source for bacteria. So bacteria can take that organic carbon and respire it, Okay, so that respiration is what basically ultimately turns the oil into CO2. Okay, and once that oil is turned into CO2, that's basically, it's been destroyed as far as the environment is concerned. And so that's the, our ultimate aim is to, is to get all of the oil that we've spilt and transfer it to CO2. Okay, so the, the, the easiest way of doing that, the most efficient way, is just to burn it. So you might see uh, them kind of collecting the oil together in big booms and setting them on fire. And that looks horrible, there's black smoke going into the atmosphere. That is the best way to get rid of it, because ultimately we want the oil to be CO2. Okay, so bacteria degrade the oil, okay, and sometimes the oil kind of like makes its way up the food chain, which has toxicological effects as well, but the aim is to remove the oil and turn it into CO2 by bacterial degradation. Okay, so the counter to that is that that has another adverse effect. So you hopefully you remember that kind of that summary reaction. So it's not an actual reaction, but the summary reaction of photosynthesis, kind of one way degradation, the other way. So if we use up organic carbon, okay, we do respiration, that removes oxygen from the environment. So this is a map from the Deepwater Horizon, 
uh, well blowout um, plus the fuck disaster that we did. Um, and you can see here that these are these colours here, and it's got a really weird scale, so it's basically integrating the oxygen loss over the whole water column. So there are regions quite a long way away from the world that have had substantial oxygen removal. Okay, so you've put so much oil into the water column, and actually one of the things that they did was they put dispersant at the wellhead when it was leaking at the bottom. So that means instead of the oil making it way up to the surface, okay, it started to disperse into very, very small droplets throughout the whole water column. So there was a big plume of uh, basically oil emulsion that was kind of hidden in the, in, the, in, the, in the water column that we couldn't see. And what happened to that was that bacteria in the water column went, Whoa, look at that, look at that organic carbon. They went, rrr, 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 and they ate all of that organic carbon and used up the, water used up the oxygen in the water column, okay? which was bad for all of the fish that lived in that water column because then there was no oxygen, so they kind of swam away. Okay, so it's had quite a substantial impact on kind of the ecosystem from uh, an oxygen point of view, not just the toxicity of the oil itself. Okay, so another type of pollutant, heavy metals. So, uh, so what do we mean by heavy metals? So, I mean, the term heavy metal doesn't, I mean, doesn't have any kind of uh, scientific basis at all. So it's basically a group of of metal elements that are thought to be quite toxic, okay? And they're called heavy metals because the ones that, that were, you know, lead, cadmium, mercury, uranium, those kind of, kind of things that sound quite toxic because they are, um, they're quite, they've got quite a high atomic mass, they're quite heavy. But, I mean, you can say that anything almost down to iron could be considered a heavy metal, okay? And almost any element in excess is toxic. But these, these guys up here are particularly toxic Uranium is quite interesting. So if you, if you, if you start eating uranium, not, not advised. Um, so uranium is radioactive, but it's, it's so toxic that the toxicity of uranium will kill you before the radioactivity. Okay? That's not true of all radioactive elements, um, but, uh, but it is true of uranium. Okay? So these are, these, are, these are basically nasties that we don't really want in the environment in any concentration above what is, what is natural. Okay? Uh, I've put on here these... Um, these are the non, kind of, these are the um, uh, synthetic chemicals. So these aren't heavy metals, but I've just, just mentioned them briefly. So things like uh, DDT, which is dichlorodiphenyl, something trichlorodiphenyl. It's like super toxic. Okay, and we'll come on to see that later. And this, I think, is Agent Orange, which is also um, unpleasant to have in the environment. Ooh, that's, that's that. Anyway, so, um, so this is another example of this. Is biomagnification. So this in case we're looking at DDT, which is this dichlorodi something 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 tetraethylene, <coughs> which is the super toxic uh, man-made chemical. So the uh, kind of concentration in the environment very very low, but as you move up trophic levels through zooplankton up into kind of like zooplankton eaters and then kind of uh, more predatory type of organisms, the concentration just gets exponentially higher. Okay. So that's going to obviously have big, big impacts if you start eating cormorants or ospreys, which also I don't recommend. Um, so we talk a little bit about what is the effect of some of these toxins. So uh, things are poisonous, or things things are bad for the environment because they do a whole bunch of different things. Okay, so uh, so uh, a pollutant or a toxin might have an effect at a cellular level, or even smaller than that, on a particular biochemical process. Okay, and we'll come on to see that later on with mercury poisoning. So there's some biochemical process which is essential for life, and the toxin might stop that happening. Okay, then everything that organism does that relies on that biochemical process obviously is bad if you can't do that. Okay, you can also have these uh, other kind of larger scale changes in an organism. Um, so changes in physiology or behaviour, which then affect the kind of the viability of the, that survival of that species. Um, and just as an example of, of how kind of weird and esoteric these things can be, um, I, was at a, I was at a conference on coral reefs, because, uh, you know, that's high roll, uh, and um, I'd given my talk, uh, and my talk was on kind of geological coral reefs, so there were not very many people in my talk, um, and there were loads and loads of sessions on fish, because, you know, people like to eat fish, and the coral reef community is basically supported financially by the fishing industry. Um, so uh, I went to loads of talks on fish, and I found out that um, I went to this one talk which was looking about the effect of carbon dioxide on fish. 
Okay, so carbon dioxide itself is not toxic at all to fish. They have this, they have this mechanism in their kind of their body which can regulate the amount of dissolved inorganic carbon in their bodies. So they can survive up to, so, so at the moment, the atmospheric um, uh, carbon dioxide concentration is about 400 parts per million. And that's reflected in the, the concentration in the, the ocean through that uh, exchange between the ocean and the atmosphere. And fish can survive up to maybe 10,000 ppm. They can basically deal with that amount of carbon dioxide. Okay, and they, they can survive perfectly well, but they get confused. So it turns out that fish can be right or left-handed, even though they don't have hands. So if you startle a, a specific fish, it will always turn left. But if you startle another fish in the same fish, it might turn right all the time. Every time you, you startle the fish, it goes Okay? But if you kind of grow that fish and put that in a, in a, a tank of water that's got really, really high CO2, and you startle it, it forgets whether it's left or right-handed. So you startle it and it goes, ooh, ooh. Okay, and that's a small behavioural change, okay? confusing fish, whether they're left or right-handed. Okay? But what it does mean, if you're a shark and you come along, you startle that fish, okay? and it goes, oh, left, right, left, right, it's going to get eaten. Okay? So behavioural change can have a significant impact on the, kind of the, the long-term survival of a specific organism in that ecosystem. Okay, and then that has impacts on population, community structure, which then provides all kinds of ecosystem services and food and all kinds of things to us as people. Okay, so we're going to talk about nutrients and, and why they're kind of bad too much. So uh, we put lots of sewage into the ocean. Uh, most of the sewage we put into the ocean in the Western world is, is kind of kind of treated. Um, in developing countries, less so. Um, uh, and when that these, this kind of sewage gets in the environment, it's putting in to the environment a whole bunch of stuff. It's putting in organic carbon and it's putting in nutrients. Okay, we know what happens to when you have nutrients and organic carbon. Okay, so this is, you know, some, some, the, uh, sometimes the environment can deal with it, sometimes it can't. Um, okay, and when we put this stuff in, it depends on you know how it's released. So sometimes it's released as a point source, sometimes it's more diffuse. If you put all our sewage in groundwater, that will eventually make its way out into the ocean. If we put it in a pipe, that will go to a point source and you'll have a very concentrated supply in a very localized area. Okay, so when we put those nutrients into the ocean, okay, we have this 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 thing happens called eutrophication. So the word eutrophication means very well or good and troph means nourish, so we basically were adding kind of stuff that life wants into the ocean, okay, and then life happens, like, dramatically, it goes, wow, I'll grow lots of algae. So this is, this is uh, China, just before the 2008 Olympics, this is where we're going to do the sailing, obviously all that algae in the water is not so good. Um, you can get algal blooms that produce toxins, uh, which, are, which are obviously bad, and, and you know, you can also have them on things like golf courses, which make them look not very nice. Okay, so uh, there are a whole bunch of kind of impacts, kind of visual, environmental toxicity. If you put too much nutrients in, you can get lots of this algal production. So basically anywhere where you have lots of nitrate, lots of phosphate, and basically in the surface ocean, you'll always have light, because that's, you know, shining down from the sky in the very surface. You'll always have dissolved inorganic carbon, because that's in equilibrium with the atmosphere as well. So if we dump loads of nitrate and phosphate in, we're going to get algae. Okay? Um, so more algae, I mean that's kind of good, that's producing, that's taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, uh, putting it into organic carbon, kind of good if you want to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, but it does have, there's a, <coughs> does have a downside, so you put all of that organic matter into the surface ocean, that will ultimately sink into the deep ocean, and when it sinks into the, the deep ocean, or even just, just, the, just out of that surface layer that can exchange with the atmosphere, so this, the vertical scale on this can be something like hundreds of metres in the ocean, or in lakes or coastal environments, it can just be maybe a few centimetres. Okay, so we can, we can basically end up with the bottom part of the water has no oxygen in it, because it gets used up by all this respiration. No oxygen means all of our lovely macrofauna, they die which is bad. Uh, we also have this process called denitrification where if you run out of, if there's no oxygen, bacteria will start to use the nutrients, nitrates, instead of oxygen, 
um, uh, so basically as an oxidizer, okay? And that produces this, this species nitrous oxide, which is a super powerful greenhouse gas. So even though we might be like removing carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, we'll be producing an even more powerful greenhouse gas, which is super bad. Okay, so this is an example of where this is happening. We touched on this uh, last time, I think, this is Chesapeake Bay. And this is just an example of how these things are uh, affected by different parts of climate. So it's not just us putting nutrients in. So this is winter, and this is summer. Okay, and this is the oxygen concentration. So this is the oxygen concentration at the bottom, not the top. And this is a profile through. So you can see, in the winter, it's stormy, okay? The bay is well mixed, okay? So that means it has a high oxygen concentration because the whole of the water column can mix with the atmosphere. Okay, in the summer, we have this kind of layer of water on top, which is basically well stratified, so oxygen cannot mix, okay, with the deep water, and we end up with um, uh, removal of oxygen from the bottom water. Okay, and this is kind of just how it happens through time. So this is the year, January to December. So you can see it's cold in the winter, warm in the summer, and when it gets warm, we get this bloom of productivity, partially because, you know, you get light, because it's in the summer now, partially because it's warmer, so production happens faster, and that excess production causes there to be less oxygen. Okay. And a little bit more detail, it's not just that it's warmer and it's um, more light uh, in the summer, we also get the stratification. So this is the same, the red line here is the decline in oxygen, and the blue line is basically how stratified the water column is. So hopefully this will give an example. So basically in the summer, we develop uh, a warm layer, okay, which is also a little bit less salty because in the summer, or in the spring actually, all of the ice and snow that fell over North America kind of runs off as water, as fresh water. So we end up with a very low density layer on top of deep water, which is more dense, so that causes the density gradient to get higher. If the density gradient is high, it's very hard to mix oxygen across that gradient because the bottom water gets more and more anoxic. Okay, so you can read those in your own time. Um, okay, so it's not just in bays. In estuaries, you can have these happening in the open ocean. So this is an example of New York. It's Hudson River at the top, Long Island. So this is a region of the ocean here which is suffering from this local hypoxia caused by excess productivity in the surface, which is caused by nutrients coming down the Hudson. Similarly, in the Mississippi, okay, loads of nutrients come down the Mississippi River. Coriolis causes them to go this way. Uh, and we get this huge area where, okay, so you can see here, so this is uh, showing uh, the productivity in the deep water, and this is showing the oxygen concentration, or the oxygen loss, okay? So you have these huge areas across the continental shelf that are almost devoid of oxygen. So this is called the, the Gulf of Mexico dead zone, because everything's dead. Okay, so then again, we're going to talk a little bit about um, heavy metal poisoning. So this is uh, a case study from Japan, a specific disease called Minamata disease, uh, which is caused by mercury poisoning. Okay, and I hope we're going to see that it's not just you know, mercury is bad, but there are biogeochemical cycles that happen in the ocean and the coastal environment that determine how toxic um, mercury is and its impact on the environment. So it's not just we put it in, it's bad. We put it in, stuff happens, which we have some control over, uh, which makes it either worse or better. So, um, just quickly, so this is, um, this is one of the worst films ever made, uh, Evolution. Uh, but the reason I put it in is because the reason that these guys kill the aliens in the end is because Head and Shoulders uh, has um, selenium in it. Okay, so when you Google selenium, this is one of the things that comes up. Okay, and selenium is toxic to the fictional aliens, uh, but it's actually one of these really essential elements, essential, yeah, elements, metals, that we need, and all life needs, to basically function. So, uh, it's kind of, yeah, so... Selenium, if you have like multivitamins, selenium is one of like the essential like five a day vitamins or whatever it is. Um, and, it's, and it's mostly important basically for your immune system and this antioxidant kind of, kind of, kind of pseudoscience bullshit that people that try and sell you vitamins um, do. So 
This is kind of why it's important. So there's this particular molecule, this selenocysteine. So seleno means selenium, and cysteine is that thing. Um, so this is, an, this is a, a small biomolecule that gets forms part of this larger um, enzyme thing called ferroxidin reductase. Okay, so this is, this is one of these kind of like long chain biomolecule things that, that we have in all of our cells. Um, and this is basically a very important enzyme because it, it mops up oxidative stress. So any kind of free radicals that you have kind of flying around in your body, this kind of molecule kind of neutralizes them or gets rid of that excess oxidative stress, which uh, has this huge range of impacts on all kinds of things in kind of basically multicellular organisms, okay? So things like uh, sunburns, getting anywhere you've been kind of like damaged by radiation, I mean, this thing um, helps stop that happen <coughs> and also helps kind of, you know, repair the damage. Um, so if we don't have this, then all of these things start to fail, okay? So the problem is that if we put mercury into us, okay, mercury exchanges with the selenium. So actually this, this more molecule up here, which I've forgotten the name of already, um, selenosustine, cysteine thing, it actually would much rather make uh, a mercury cysteine, okay? So it's much more energetically favorable for that molecule to be the mercury than the selenium, okay? Which is fine for the molecule, but then when you make these things out of it, okay, and that will happen because uh, they're very, very similar in their shape. So if you replace the selenium with the mercury, these things don't work, okay? So your, your body spends loads of energy creating these huge molecules, right, but they don't work, okay? Which means all of these things that, that mod, this, this theroduxin reductase is protect, protecting you from, okay, that doesn't happen. Okay, so you start to get kind of organ failure, your skin falls apart, your brain goes nuts, all this kind of stuff, right? So super bad. Okay, um, <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about mercury now. So mercury has a whole bunch of different forms. There's in different oxidation states. This is elemental mercury, various forms of uh, inorganic ionized mercury and uh, organic mercury. So over here, you saw some pour some mercury into a pool. And now we're just looking at under UV light, okay? So you can see that nice little pool of mercury is now giving off, well, it's giving off basically vapors, which you can only see in UV light. So this is the um, elemental mercury. And I put this in just to show that if you see like a pool of mercury on the floor, if you break a thermometer, if you smash a fluorescent light bulb, okay, you can't see anything nasty coming off that. But if you turn UV lights on, you see these plumes of mercury coming off it. So if you learn one thing, from the lecture, if you break a mercury thermometer, open the window, because you really don't want to be breathing that stuff in, okay? But it turns out that this elemental mercury is the least toxic of all of the mercuries, okay? So, uh, so as you progressively oxidize your mercury to mercury one plus, mercury two plus, uh, it becomes more and more toxic. And it becomes more toxic because it's basically, it becomes more and more soluble. So it's more available in the environment, okay? As you get up to these organic forms of mercury, so this methyl mercury and dimethyl mercury. So it turns out that dimethyl mercury is one of the most toxic substances known to man. Um, there was a case of uh, an analytical chemist, and she got less than a pinhead of it on her skin. Didn't puncture the skin, just on her skin. Washed it off immediately. Um, two days later, she was dead. Okay, so it's super, super toxic. So if anybody says, hey, can you hold this dimethyl mercury for me? No. Okay, so this is where this stuff comes from. So I mean, I mean it's, I mean, it's like, like, like almost all pollutants, it is naturally occurring in the environment. Okay, so it comes from things like volcanoes and weathering. And over here on the left, you can see basically uh, through time vertically, the kind of concentration of, of mercury that's been recorded um, being deposited into an ice core. So this is stuff that's made into the atmosphere and being deposited in an ice core. And you see that when you have large volcanic eruptions, Tambora, Krakatoa, Mount St. Helens, up there you can see in blue. This pusses, puss, pusses, puts, yes. puts lots of mercury into the environment, and that kind of rains out uh, onto, onto the land. Um, there are these additional anthropogenic sources, though. So we have uh, gold mining. So 
back in the day when we didn't really know what we were doing, um, gold mining, uh, what you did was you got your rock and you mixed it up with mercury, and the mercury grabbed the gold. Okay, and you threw away the rock. Okay, the rock still had lots of mercury in it. Um, so that was very polluting to the environment. Um, so this kind of process does still go on uh, in uh, sort of artisanal uh, gold mining operations in um, developing countries where there's less regulation. Okay, so not only do you have like lots of horrible working conditions for the people that are basically slaves, uh, they're also dying of mercury poisoning because that's how they extract the gold from the uh, rock. Um, in addition to that, there's this process that uh, the chemists came up with, this chloralkali process, which was to basically make chlorine and um, sodium hydroxide. Uh, basically, these two elements, well, these two molecules are, are basically some of the, the, the fundamental building blocks of industrial chemistry, so making plastics and detergents and all kinds of things. And the way that that process works is that you basically melt salt, which takes lots of energy, and then you put it in a, uh, a container that's got a pool of mercury at the bottom. And that mercury acts as a conductor, uh, allowing you to split these two things apart using electrolysis. Um, OK, another source of mercury is, well, some of the main sources of mercury, so that big, long increase um, through the 20th century is basically from coal burning. So coal is not just made of carbon. It has lots of other elements in it as well. One of those elements is mercury. So this is long annex, um, just across the firth. Uh, which, um, which basically you burn coal, mercury goes into the um, atmosphere. So the less of this stuff we do, the better for the environment, for all kinds of reasons. Um, of course, you know, SMP don't want to shut that. So, yeah, SMP. Um, right, so I think I'll just put this in. So these are some of the, some of the, um, the molecules that you can make if you do this for our blood process. So, um, that guy on the, uh, uh, this chloropricin, phosgene, sulfur mustard, these are common chemical weapons. So these are the kind of things that are being used at the moment in Syria and Iraq. Um, and these are, uh, well, you know, mostly invented by good patriotic British chemists um, uh, between the wars. Um, and these are made with, so the greens on all of these things are chlorine. Okay, so to make these things, you need to do this. Okay? And the point I put chemical weapons in here is because when you, if you were going to make chemical weapons, right, you wouldn't tell anybody about it, would you? Because people would come along and go, please don't make those chemical weapons. So, so this is an actual chemical weapons facility that uh, uh, is well, now in Kazakhstan, formerly the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union up until 1991. We're busy making loads and loads of chemical weapons here at Plavdar. Okay, so you can see now that the buildings have mostly all been demolished, but um, no one knew about it, right? Because it's a secret chemical weapons facility. So uh, they had one of these big bath thingies full of thousands of, of, of kilos uh, of, of mercury. And what do you do with that when you are shutting down your secret chemical weapons factory? Okay. What they did was they buried it, okay. um, which was totally retarded. Um, but these were, these were basically a whole bunch of very intelligent scientists that had just been suddenly made unemployed. And they were like, sod it, we're off to become kind of industrial chemists in the West. So that's what they did. So they dumped this thing, and now there's this basically plume of mercury contamination that's making its way up towards this um, lake up here where the locals, and there's this town down here, Pogda, uh, um, they get fishing. So that's obviously really bad. Um, so I put that in because stuff like this shouldn't happen. Okay? And the reason it shouldn't happen is because we should know about all of these industrial sites, okay? uh, and they should be regulated. Okay? So regulation is good okay? because it stops stuff like this happening. Um, okay, so very briefly, when this stuff gets into the environment, so this is an example, this is an example from Japan. So this, uh, they have a factory, and they put the mercury into the environment. And actually, they put it into the environment in the most toxic form, in this mercury, um, methyl mercury. Um, so this is where the factory is. So this is, uh, I can't remember the name of the island, but it's a big factory, little fishing village. So there's, 
there's how it existed in, in uh, 1974, so you can just about make out the factory up there. This is the harbour. Okay, so they noticed that nothing, something was not quite right. So there was, there was a huge in, incidence of, of basically disease in this kind of local area. So people had these kind of deformed hands, they kind of lost quite a lot of mental uh, cognitive, cognitive ability, um, okay, uh, lots of um, fetal deformities. Um, so what was happening was uh, at this factory, uh, they were basically make, they were doing this process that makes some of these uh, products, I think some um, acetic acid and acetylene and things like this, were basically the building blocks of quite a lot of plastics. And the process that, that they, they make that, they use a mercury catalyst, which ends up being used up a little bit, and they basically, the waste product, they put into the ocean. Okay? So it went into the ocean. And this is where it kind of gets scientifically interesting, because when you put that stuff in the ocean, let's see if I've got this right. Um, so this is what the factory, they put in basically methyl mercury. Okay? That methyl mercury gets eaten, taken up into the food chain. Okay? which is bad for those organisms, it's kind of toxic, so those, those they don't necessarily immediately die, but you're basically forming organic material that has mercury in it and exporting it down to the sediments. Okay? And that would be great if that's what happened, and that's all that happened, because that's basically taking the mercury out of the environment, putting it into the sediments, okay? it's no longer in the water column. Okay? But, okay, so we're also, so also putting it into the environment up there, and, and basically if Thing. Um, in the presence of sunlight, methyl mercury can be converted into these um, less toxic forms. Okay, into mercury, native mercury, and mercury two. If you convert it to native mercury, that can be kind of like that that little plume we saw earlier can go up into the atmosphere. Yeah, it goes into the atmosphere. It can be exported away to somewhere else. Okay, somewhere else gets more polluted, but where you are, you're taking the pollution away. Um, some of this um, mercury that doesn't get put up into the atmosphere can make its way back into the dissolved mercury 2 form, which can make its way back into the food chain. So stuff's going into the food chain either directly or through this kind of oxidative cycle and then back into the food chain. Okay, so we're forming this stuff in sediments. Okay, so if the sediments are anoxic, okay, we can convert this Organic mercury ultimately gets converted into mercury sulfide. Okay, it's a mineral called cinnabar, and that is solid. Okay, so that is a good place for it to be because that's kind of taking it out of the bioavailable pool. Okay, the problem with having it in the anoxic sediments is that, that that hydrogen sulfide can get eaten by types of bacteria that like to eat sulfide. So, not all bacteria kind of munch organic matter uh, and uh, respire. Into, into CO2, some bacteria like to eat minerals. Okay, and those bacteria, commonly called sulfur-reducing bacteria, SRB, and they take that sulfur, or that they take that mercury and sulfur. Okay, mercury and sulfur, and they start to make it into more bioavailable forms again. Okay, so. Processes within the sediment, bacteria munching away on that kind of what they thought was a nice pyrite crystal, in fact, releasing all this mercury back into the environment. Okay, so this is kind of what happened, and it turns out that one of the diagnostic things of how they figured out what was happening is basically cats. Okay, cats were dying quite a lot from mercury poisoning. And they figured this out, but, well, they figured out that the, what the problem was that cats eat a lot of fish. <coughs> and the fish were coming from the sea. So this is, uh, this is basically a, a, a type of diagram which describes how toxins are bad. So uh, if you, so, so the vertical axis is uh, the mercury concentration in fish. Okay, so these are kind of like normal fish, and polluted fish would be way up there on that one there. Okay? And then how, whether that's bad for you or not depends on how much fish you eat. Okay, so if you don't eat any fish, Okay? It doesn't matter how contaminated the fish are, it ain't going to be a problem for you. Okay? But if you eat a shitload of fish, okay, it doesn't, you know, those fish don't have to have a very, very high concentration of mercury for it to be a problem for you. Okay? 
So these are the these, these curve lines are basically this the bottom one is when it, the World Health Organization thinks it's safe, and the, the top one is basically when you start to see signs of this disease. And you can notice that it's a logarithmic scale. So if you look at say uh, USA, okay, if you're if you're an American and you're eating tuna or swordfish, so these are things that are quite high up the food chain, they've got quite a lot of mercury in them, okay, you would plot here, okay, and you would be therefore safe. Okay? If you were, however, from Minamata in Japan, you eat lots of fish, okay? Because culturally, Japanese people eat a lot of fish. And the fish that you're eating, okay, have got a concentration up there, maybe a hundred times, thousand times more mercury than your, um, say, Pacific uh, fish here. So you're way up there, okay? So you're in this kind of zone where you're going to have a problem. So it's not just how contaminated the thing is, it's how much of it you eat. So, uh, so that's why, that's, I mean, that's that, what happened, that was bad. So this is what they're doing about it. So this is that Minamata Bay. Uh, this uh, hashed area is where they built on top of the seafloor to build a new harbour. Um, so they've basically, they've gone for regulation, right? So they've stopped them putting it into the ocean, okay? That's the first thing you should do. If you're, if you're fucking something up, right, stop what you're doing. Okay, so this is another example where more regulation, okay, uh, more monitoring of these things is, is a good thing. But all of this mercury now is mostly in the sediment of the bay. Okay? So anything that happens to that bay, if they disturb the sediments, if they you know, do a little bit of dredging, they anchor there, or if this natural process of, of sulfur reducing bacteria, that's slowly just releasing that mercury back up into the environment. Okay? So this place will be toxic for, as far as we're concerned, forever. So what they're doing is, uh, so you see this dotted line, the plan is to build on top of it just kind of uh, and hide the mercury away from it all. Okay? So that's extremely expensive. So I'm not sure how much yen are worth at the moment, but it's a big number. Okay? So, uh, so actually, so this is what it was in 1970 something. I think if you put on, and you can see that's, that's what they've done so far. So there's still all of this bay up here okay, to go. Okay? So huge amount of work that needs to be done to put this right. Okay, so you can, you can read through that in your own time. We're kind of a little bit uh, uh, late. But um, I thought I'd just, I mean, this is kind of like the last lecture that I'm giving you. So I just, I mean, I don't want to end on such like a crappy downer, right? So pollution's really bad, we've messed everything all up. But I think one of the important things is that, that understanding these processes that affect the toxicity of stuff, that affect how it's moved through the environment, okay, if we can understand those, okay, then we can really start to do something about it. And this is kind of like a bit of a call to arms, uh, but this is the kind of stuff that hopefully some of you will be doing as careers, okay? This kind of land remediation, the, the people working with NGOs and, and policymakers to make decisions about stop doing that, that's retarded, right? Um, this is the kind of stuff that hopefully you will be doing as, um, as you know, citizens of the world, okay? So read through those, those kind of summaries are important. Um, and just okay, so if you like oceanography, um, you may also like, um, so there's a bunch of other courses next year or in the, in the, in the, the honours uh, year that, um, that maybe are relevant. Some of them in um, environmental and uh, ecological environmental sciences. So Margaret Graham's environmental pollution course um, is very highly thought of. Um, aquatic systems is quite interesting. Um, and then in the fourth year, these are kind of more discussion things. So discussing some of the research in these areas um, you might find interesting or relevant. Okay, so um, that's me done. Um, oh, do you guys know about the um, revision session question and answer thing? Has Simon publicised that at all? Yes? No? He has? He, this was, uh, he's penciled in like one session that on the 20 something of something or other uh, this month, I think, towards the end. I think it's the 26th or 27th. He'll send an email if he hasn't done already. So I think Simon Merriweather and myself will be there to, when, when is it? That's, that's something else you're doing. Okay, right. Um, so come to that if you don't know, if you, don't, if you, if you want to ask a question. Also feel free to email or come to the office hours or use the online discussion forum where I've put some kind of, I've put a link to all of the past papers if you don't know where the past papers are yet. Okay, so that's...